bond section. Jimmy asked me to, you know, come by here and give a, a talk to you people about Hurricane Sandy. Well, Hurricane Sandy was an interesting beast. It's late in the season. You know, it's a late October storm. Uh, right around Halloween time. The crucial thing for us was how big the damn storm was. The storm was humongous. I mean, normal hurricanes are, you know, not that broad. This thing was over 200 miles wide. What does that mean? Well, basically it means the storm, once it hits, it's going to be there for a while before the back edge gets through. So one of the issues we had right away was trying to prepare for this. Hurricane Sandy was a, another, another weird storm for several other reasons. And that was, it started in the Caribbean. It didn't start off Africa where a lot of hurricanes start. It actually started off the Caribbean, down in the, uh, uh, around St. Croix, St. Thomas, that area. And it came up along the East Coast. Now, early on, the play out was, man, we're going to get whacked. The Rhode Island is going to be on the right shoulder, and we are going to get hit. A little later on, they made a couple of different tracks, potentially, for the storm. One was it going in around Washington, D.C. It was going to take a left-hand turn. That's not usual for a hurricane. Hurricanes take right-hand turns. They swing out to sea. They go either straight up through Connecticut and that area, up into the... Uh, you know, New Hampshire and Vermont, like 38 Hurricane did. But taking a left-hand turn is really weird. And then one of the other tracks was they're going to take a left-hand turn right around New York City. Now, basically, what did that mean to us? Well, it meant very simply, we are going to have some real wind and sea conditions that normally maybe we wouldn't see. You know, we remember Irene. Irene was a windy storm, but it was a small storm. When it came through here, it went up the Connecticut area. We got hit, but we didn't get hit as bad as we could have. In this storm here, if the storm was going up straight, it would have gone right up through New Haven and everything else, and then we would have been really whacked. We would have had the high wind, high surf, high tides. Everything would have been happening to us that time. Now, again, forecasters started to get a narrower viewpoint of it. And they started to forecast it was going to go in around the New Jersey area. And what that meant was we were still going to get whacked by the right-hand turn of the storm, the right-hand shoulder, you can call it, which is the area of the storm that has high winds, high surf. Everything is piling into the shoreline. Basically, it was a Category 1 hurricane. It could have been a lot worse. It could have been a Category 2, 3, whatever. You know, the hur Hurricane Gloria was a Category 3. The 38 Hurricane, that was a hurricane. Hey, Jimmy. Nice of you to come down. I know somebody reminded me it was class time. <laughs> well, I waited till 3.35 and said, that's it. That's fine, John. You've been here before. I know. Anyway, it was a Category 1 hurricane, which meant basically winds of 85 miles an hour. Now, 85 miles an hour is not as bad as it could have been, but 85 miles an hour over a period of time makes it really a dangerous storm. It's that length of time that we're going to have to be subjected to the wind and to the waves and to the surf, to the high tides and so forth, that makes a hurricane dangerous. Again, what they were saying was the real hurricane winds are going to be south of us. <laughs> Don't tell us too often, but we got hurricane winds over 80 miles an hour. Again, in effect, low areas were going to have problems with, uh, basically, with the flooding. It was coming in at a high tide. The high tide was going to aggravate the whole situation because now we got a storm surge, which is above and beyond the level of the water in normal times. Now, people were forecasting storm surges all the way from, you know, 20 feet to 30 feet or more. What it actually was around 20 feet. And again... It was going to affect all along the south coast, the south coast of Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. They were talking about flooding to the east coast of Massachusetts, which was going to be up around Boston area. This storm was massive. 
it was so broad that it was going to cause an effect no matter where it came ashore. When we saw the storm on the radar, you can see from here, here's the shoreline. Here's the outer bands. That's over 200 miles. That thing couldn't miss much because it was so big. It wasn't like a small active hurricane like Gloria was coming up. No, this one was going to be a broad storm. And again, late in the season, poses all sorts of problems. Again, we were, we were dealing with severe beast erosion, coastal flooding, heavy rains, power outages, trees down, all sorts of problems. Again, the marine impact, dangerous, life-threatening seas. You know, they're talking seas 25 to 30 feet highest south of New England. You know, any, any boat out there is going to be in trouble. A lot of boats headed out to sea to get as far away from the shore as possible which is a good idea. Boats ride out better when they're at sea than sometimes when they're tied up to the dock. Again, we had a storm that was going to start at 11 a.m. and go through 8 p.m. with the strongest thing. That's a long period of time. Normal hurricanes last a couple hours. 11 to 8 is 9 hours. We were going to be under the gun for 9 straight hours. Again, we were going to have storms, rain, other factors the next day after the storm went by. You know, a storm goes by, it doesn't just clear up and that's it. You get all sorts of squall lines. You get the, out, the really outer bands coming in to shore, causing problems. South coast, east coast. South coast, morning and evening. Again, we're talking along where we were. Again, four to six foot storm surge possible. They were having higher ones than that. We were getting around 20 feet. Some of the buoys offshore were over 20 feet high at the time of high tide. Again, we were planning for a long duration storm. What was actually happening was, you know, the normal uh, observed or the prediction was that, you know, down here. These blue lines are the prediction. That was what it was supposed to be. The residual is just like normal, normal tides. And we were getting into the high tide period when the tides were getting higher as they were. Then we started on top of it, the predicted, and then actual was the red line. You can see how much higher it was because of the amount of wave action was coming ashore and the big storm was pushing a hell of a lot of water ahead of it. What we expected from the wind was damaging winds from the interior. You know, we expected that most of Rhode Island was going to suffer heavy wind damage, which meant trees. We were lucky in one thing. It was in the fall. A lot of trees have already shed their leaves. Leaves produce problems because they give windage. If the winds are high and the tree still has its leaves on, the tendency is for that tree to become more stressed than if it was strictly lost its leaves. We lucked out that a lot of the trees have started to drop their leaves this year. And it was luckily for us, because otherwise we would have had a lot more damage. When Irene hit, she hit when trees were fully butted out, and the damage was much greater, all the way up into New Hampshire. Again, coastal plain, 40 to 50 mile an hour gusts. We had gusts 80 plus at a couple of places off Block Island. Again, 40 to 50 mile an hour winds, you know, that's pretty strong for a normal type of storm. But when you top on top of that, everything else is going on with this storm. We were running into real problems. Widespread power outages. You know, it's unfortunate, but Rhode Island has a problem where all of our power lines are above ground. Places like New Hampshire, Vermont, they have a lot of power lines, but they're all underground. So, yeah, they have problems, but they don't have the problems that we do with trees coming down. And one of the biggest problems we had during Irene and also during this storm was we haven't had a really bad hurricane for many years. You know, we've had hurricanes, sure. But they were short duration or they gave us glancing bros or they went out to sea. You know, we got some wind, but not anything of any magnitude. Irene comes along and all of a sudden we're just taking down trees everywhere. 
Now, a lot of those trees, if you looked at them, were all damaged to begin with. They were all, they were all rotted out, or they were heavily overgrown, or they were damaged by other things. We had a lot of power outages during Irene because of the trees were not that good. Now, we thought, well, okay, we'll get rid of those trees. Well, guess what? When the next storm came along, which was Sandy, <laughs> we got rid of more trees. You know, it must have been like the 38 hurricane that came through and just took down everything. I mean, I've seen pictures of hurricane damage done after the 38 hurricane. It's like somebody came through with a sigh and just took down every tree in the neighborhood. The problem we have is we rely on our power. You know, if we don't have power, what happens? We lose our freezers. We can't cook. We can't basically we panic. You know, people don't have generators. Well, now they do because they all ran out after the storm and bought them. But we rely on our power grids. And unfortunately, when the power grids are damaged, they start closing down. Again, they have a tendency to shut down whole areas if a power group falls out because they don't want to overload the system and they don't want to have problems with fires. So the system all shuts down. Basically, the worst case, or the best case scenario, would we have 20 to 30 mile an hour with gusts of 50. And we didn't have that. Scattered power outages. Worst case, which is what we had, 40 to 60 mile an hour with gusts, 80 plus. Widespread power outages. Much worse than Irene for us. You know, we thought we had it. The nice thing about it was National Grid and the other power companies had learned from Irene to be a little bit more proactive. So they had already stationed extra crews in the area. And they weren't relying on crews coming in from God knows where. The heavy rains. We expected heavy rain, but we didn't expect the torrential rains like they had down around you know, New York City, New Jersey, where they had massive rain problems. We had rain problems, but it wasn't aggravated to the point that we had of the 2010 flood system. You know, during 2010, when we had those floods, we had a 100-year flood on top of a 500-year flood. It just totally overwhelmed the state. We had, you know, communities underwater for weeks or more. Here, we expected we were going to have some street, some street flooding, some river flooding, and we definitely expected shoreline flooding. As it was, we didn't have that much in the way of stream flooding. We lucked out in certain places. Again, we are in this area right here. Come on. Ah, oh, there we go. We are right in this area here. We had, uh, you know, like maybe uh, the green here was about 0.5, 1, 5, or 1 to 1 1.5 inches. This yellow here was around 2 inches. And this area up here was around 2.5 inches. We expected a lot worse. We were lucky the storm did swing as far to as it did into the, into the New York area. It basically went way inland. That provided us some respite from the rain, not from the wind. You know, in summary, what we figured it was going to happen was at least a moderate to possibility of major impact from the Sandy. You know, we knew we were going to get hit, and we knew that we were going to get hit moderately to, you know, to severely. Uh, it all was depending on which way the waves action was and which way the storm jogged when it took its left turn. If it took a left turn longer into like New York, New, uh, Connecticut area, we would have been a lot worse. As it was, going in on, on New Jersey made it better for us. Uh, we had a very large storm. That was the big thing about Sandy. She was among us in size. She was so broad that really nobody could escape her. It wasn't to be, well, they're down there. No, she was going to nail us no matter what. Dangerous seas. You know, the seas were coming in on top of a high tide cycle. And this high cycle would only aggravate the amount of water that she brought in on the surge. Coastal flooding, beach erosion. You know, we haven't had really bad beach erosion for many years, so a lot of people weren't really prepared for it. Again, time frame. Sunday night to Tuesday. You know, when we started the setup, we were going for the long duration. So basically, you know, we knew this was going to be a problem. 
We knew we needed to do things. We needed to address the problems that you see here. The storm surge, wind damage, flooding of low-lying areas, sunken boats and vessels, power lines being brought down. With potential, some of those power lines could be PCB contaminated, polychlorinated biphenyls, better for those people who are in chemistry. That makes it an extremely hazardous waste. If you have polychlorinated biphenyls in transformers, you have an extremely hazardous situation. Again, we also had to think about what was going to happen with homeowners. Well, fuel tanks. 2010, we had over 300 oil tanks to deal with during the floods. We anticipated that we were going to be dealing with a similar amount of flooding issues which involve fuel tanks. Recovery issues for propane tanks. You know, there's nothing like following a propane tank bobbing down the highway in a flood. I did it a couple of times. You know, what are we going to tie this to? I don't care. Just tie it to a fire hydrant so it doesn't float away. You know, abandoned containers. You know, things show up that you never realized were there in the first place. They'll show up in the strangest places. You know, I found a box trailer in the middle of the swamp. Now, how the hell did it get there? I have no idea where it came from. So I can't tell you how it got there. Again, cost to the state. You know, we have normal contingency funds. But when it comes to a hurricane or a disaster, those contingency funds are kind of tight. So what do we have to do? Well, we have to start getting all our, our ducks in a row so that we can now go after emergency funds through the emergency agencies in the federal government, the, you know, the uh, FEMA people. But they're requiring us prior to an emergency, before we need them, to do certain things. We need to set up certain programs ahead of time so that they can come in and say, oh, yeah, you are all set. You know, you'll be covered. What we found out during the floods was, whoa, some of those programs we hadn't taken part of yet. So they were kind of reneging about giving us reimbursement for money that was spent. So we had to do a lot of backtracking, trying to get things written up quickly. Well, we were sort of aware of that this time. So we were sort of jumping ahead knowing that if this was going to be bad for the state, the funds needed to be gotten through the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, at the time we needed them. What did we do? Now, this is starting like on October 28th. We knew the storm was coming. We had fairly good warning when it was coming, when it was going to hit. So we started about three days ahead of the time to start preparing the state for the hurricane. You know, some things you don't see when you see it on the news, but, you know, things that you see on the news have been prepared for probably three days before that or longer. You know, every year we have a hurricane conference in which time we discuss matters of the past hurricanes and how we can make it better for, pre for hurricanes in the future. So we try to learn from our mistakes of the past to make it better for the future. Again, we notified state contractors, hey guys, don't leave your vehicles or your equipment in places that are going to get flooded. You know, get them to high ground. Get them up there out of the rain. Get them out of the flood area. You know, make sure your personnel are rested. Make sure your personnel are ready to go when we call. Now, when are we going to call? Well, I'm not going to call them out in the middle of the hurricane. I don't need to put people's lives at risk responding to an oil tank. But we want them, as soon as the storm abates, to be ready to roll with their equipment. You know, we notify various locations to secure loose materials. We have a list of firms that we know are out there that potentially have materials exposed. Could be oil, chemicals, all sorts of materials. So we tell them, look, why don't you button down your sites as best you can. You know, secure your tanks. Make sure all the valves are shut. Make sure all the piping is isolated. You know, we don't need something to fall on a pipeline that's, that basically is full of oil. Get them blown out. Get them dry. You know, if you lose an empty pipeline, big deal. That's your problem, not ours. If it turns out to have oil and spills, then we got a bigger problem because now we're involved trying to clean things up and get it back to normal. So we're trying to jump ahead, doing things that we knew in the past needed to be done. 
basically we made sure all the response vehicle the state has were ready to go fueled up ready made sure all their tires were good made sure that everything on our on our side was ready you know we told fire departments in different areas that you might want to fuel make sure all your trucks are full make sure that all your equipment is ready to go make sure all the things that you rely on are ready ropes boats whatever basically we manned what they call the emergency you know response function you know what the ESF is are series of documents that have been agreed to by different agencies that in certain areas when you call for an emergency the police have a function DEM has a function fire departments have functions DOT has functions for the emergency we made sure that everybody who was part of that ESF grouping was alerted and at the e EMA operations center which is in Cranston everybody was in place to operate those functions so in other words we had a whole bunch of computers like this room here everybody had a function everybody was man in contact with the different agencies that they control so in other words fire departments had a representative there uh, DOT had a representative there I was with the what they call ESF 10 which is the environmental function and in case there was any problems we were able to you know communicate the nice thing about it is we learned from other emergencies when we lost communication that we really needed a better form of communication ones that weren't going to be jeopardized now is that always good yeah it's, it's all great on paper but when it gets right down to it towers are just as susceptible to the wind as trees are we lost a couple of radio towers yeah. so we still are learning how to try to keep the communication and if anything I can tell you is communication is always the biggest problem you know we had electrical issues it's going to bring down trees which is going to knock out power what's more when those trees come down take down the lines they're going to take down telephone poles and on those telephone poles generally there's some sort of a transformer so we knew we were going to have transformer issues that was just a given we weren't we had national grid standing by with their contractors we had our contractors standing by the thing was once those power lines come down with those transformers attached now you got to get in there you got to get that service back up and running which means replacing the poles replacing the lines replacing the transformer now we don't jeopardize trying to get power back up by trying to clean up spills right at that time what we tried to do was realize okay the material is spilled we can control it cover it leave it on site but then we come back to dig it up again how many transformers went down over 200 again spills of, of oils depending on where the spill is it might be a big issue or it might not be a big issue you know if it's near a body of water well oil getting into a body of water poses a big problem oil going into the ground next to somebody's well could potentially take that well out of service so it all had to be looked at you know we made determinations in the field yeah we're going to get a contract to here now to clean that up or no we're going to wait till after they get the power reestablished and then come in and finish it it all depended what we saw when we got out there of course if any of them were tested to be PCB they were immediately dealt with again that's an emergency that if we consider to be an extremely hazardous issue and we jump on them right away now the good thing is in the environment right now there are not many transformers or electrical gear that have PCBs because they've been constantly being taken out of service and disposed of by the electric companies by responsible parties who have transformers that are PCB basically contaminated there are very few PCB transformers out there but they are still out there basically restore the service or clean up the site was a decision that was made based on what we saw when we got out to the site you know it's one of those things where it was important to get the service back into that neighborhood if the cleanup could be postponed 
it was scheduled, but it wasn't done right away because that way the crews could be at more important sites. You know, what do I mean by t trees coming down? Well, trees come down, things are on trees, power lines are on trees, power lines are taken out. It's a domino effect. You have one tree come down and he'll take, it'll take down four telephone poles. It could be four transformers for one tree coming down. Again, trees, some of the trees are out there, have been there probably since the 38 hurricane, so they're pretty good size. You know, they finally gave up the ghosts. They finally came over. Again, with the rain that we had, and with the wind, a constant wind. You know, if the wind blows hard for a second and then slacks off, trees can bounce back, get back to what they're supposed to. With the wind pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing, ground eventually has to give way. The roots have to give way. And you'll see a lot of trees come over with the root balls up in the air. You know, you go by now, you go by some of the swamps out there, and you can tell which ones came over during the hurricane because they all got the root balls in the air. They're leaning, leaning over with everything out of the ground. You know, transformers, those, those great things that are up on the pole, those are the transformers I'm talking about. Now, the older the transformer, the more issue we might have with PCBs. The newer ones, eh, generally, I haven't seen any new ones that have been contaminated. If they've been put up there in the last 10, 15 years, it's probably not a PCB transformer. But if they're like this, an old one, Potentially, you could have a problem with PCBs in the transformer. What we try to do is, okay, check out the transformer. Find out if it was PCB. We could do that by checking the plaque or the uh, labels on it and getting an information off of the transformer. They all have serial numbers. They all have information on their, you know, data plate. And what we did was we marked the area around where the transformer came down. Why? So that way we know where we needed to clean it up. Doesn't mean that there, we're going to be restricted only to the area of white, but it means that's where the oil hit the ground. That's where it's heaviest. We can concentrate on that instead of after they remove the transformer and the pole, well, where did the oil come down? The plate I'm talking about is this. There's a serial number over there, other information we read. You know, we did a lot of checking with National Grid. We got a serial number, they ran it for us. They said, yep, this one is a potential. Or no, this one is brand new. I like the brand new, I don't like the old ones. You know, here's an example of what I'm talking about. You know, during the storm, and I was there when the wind was blowing and everything else on this one, they had me out. And the transformer came down. It was a three bank transformer. Normally there's one transformer on a pole. But there are those that have three transformers on a pole, and when they come down, you could have 100 gallons of oil on the ground. Where did this one happen? Right next to a body of water. This is one of our more, well, we got to get to it right away. Because the longer you leave it in the ground, and again, what's going to happen? It's going to rain. When Mother Nature is raining on things, she's diluting things and forcing them to move. So when we had a potential here, of a body of water becoming contaminated, that put this transformer to a higher level. You know, when they fall, they break wide open. Now, they don't just, not like that first picture where the transformer had a slight leak. Now, this one was gone. When that transformer hit the ground, it was gone. That ground was saturated at that point, and look how close you are to the body of water. Now, about maybe 20 feet from here to there, it's about 20 feet. You get a couple of rains, and it's going to be in the water. Now we're dealing with a lot worse problem. Now we're dealing with potential contamination to the food supplies, clams, shellfish, whatever. Now we've got problems. Again, checking the plates, checking numbers. We were lucky on this one. It was a PCB. Could have been, but by checking certain numbers on that thing, we were able to tell it wasn't. Now, what do I mean by numbers? That's this thing right here. That's a record that the National Grid has you know, records on. They were able to computer tell us if it was a potential PCB or not very quickly. Now, do I believe what they tell me? No. I have test kits. I get a sample of the oil, I can test the oil right then and there to see if it is. I try to believe what they tell me, but I don't always believe what they tell me. 
Now, what do we do for the cleanup? Well, we had roving teams with big vacuum trucks. You know, it would take too long to hand dig everything. So what we did was we brought out these super suckers. And they would literally go in, break up the ground where the contamination was, suck it into the truck, go from one point to the next point to the next point to the next point. They rove with the teams. The first guys in would, would have been the line guys to secure the line, make sure the lines are dead. The next guys in would have been the pole guys. Then depending on the condition of the situation with the oil spillage, the next thing in would have been a cleanup contractor. And after them came the transformer guys to put the transformers back up on the poles, put the lines to the transformer and give service. It changed around. Sometimes cleanup was down the line when they had time to go back to the sites that weren't necessarily most dangerous for us. Again, splicing poles. You lose the top of the pole, do you put up a whole new pole or you just put up a brand new section? In this case, put up a brand new section. Forget the the part that broke off, and we'll re-rig it later on. You know, things were being done quickly to get service back to the public. Again, cleaning it up. How do you know it's clean? Well, after you think you've got it clean, you take a field sample, you analyze it, see if there's any petroleum products in the ground. That can be done with the analytical equipment that takes we take out in the field. And then they take a sample and send it to the lab for confirmation. They do a field analysis. Then they do a laboratory analysis. Based on the laboratory analysis, they'll know for sure it's clean or not. Now, we were lucky in certain aspects because, very simple, we had heavy rain. We had rain. Oil will not sink underwater if it's not PCB. So in other words, if you had oil on, sitting on top of the water table and you got to it quick enough, you didn't have to dig down but maybe six inches. You didn't have to go down three feet. If we waited, as the water table drops, so does the oil. The oil then smears all the dirt in between where the water table is and where the surface is, and now we have to take out a lot more. In this case, we didn't have to take out but maybe six inches. We had over 200 transformers brought down by Hurricane Sandy. Now, we had a lot, I think we had more during Irene. I want to say more like 400 or so transformers down by Irene. But luckily it wasn't all in the state of Rhode Island. There was a lot in Connecticut, New Hampshire, and that area. Of that number, two were confirmed to be PCB contaminated. Now, 200 down, two pos or positive for PCB. That's what I mean. We're getting better and better. Every year there are less and less PCB transformers out there to deal with. Eventually when I retire, when I retire... I probably won't have any more PCB transformers out there. Does that mean the PCB issues are gone? No, unfortunately not, because there are other places that have PCBs. Hydraulic oil, for instance. I had a laugh. I did a sample of a hydraulic oil on a fire truck. It was PCB contaminated. Why? PCBs were originally put into the environment to prevent fires. It's a fire retardant. So any place where there's a jeopardy of a transformer fire that would be really nasty, they put PCBs in the oil. They weren't cheap transformers. They were expensive. PCBs were not cheap to put in the oil. But then all of a sudden we found out it destroys your liver. Again, the issue of contamination to the soil and water in Rhode Island was dealt with as quickly as possible by the contractors hired by National Grid and the state of Rhode Island. You know, if they, all their contractors were busy and we had a situation, we have a list of contractors and we put to work cleaning up those spots that National Grid wasn't able to get to. And we had them do other things besides just take care of oil spills from transformers. But they were working right alongside. We had contractors from as far south as Tennessee coming this way, which is great. The more people, the better. More, the more response we can initiate. Again, the expected storm surge was higher than expected by about two feet. Everybody anticipated it to be here. Unfortunately, it was two foot above that. And again, the, the, basically the size of the storm caused that. You had such a massive, broad storm, it was pushing a lot more water than we thought. 
And when it came ashore, we found out how much more. The amount of erosion along the beaches was terrible. Four to four plus feet of sand in some places. You know, how high did it get? Well, this is a building. That's the high tide or high water mark. Now, that's like five foot. Now, people were anticipating some flooding, but they didn't expect that they have an indoor swimming pool inside their house. The damage was fantastic down somewhere around the beach communities. We lucked out that we didn't have that kind of damage all throughout the state like we had during 2010 with the river flooding. Yeah, we had a bed along the shoreline, but it could have been a lot worse if it had happened along the rivers also. Again, that is where the water level was. Now, what did that mean to the homes in this area? Well, if you put up siding, guess what? You're going to have to put up more siding. It just literally, this storm surge just stripped everything off houses. If it wasn't nailed down, screwed down, attached in such a way, when the homeowners came back, they found either their house was gone or the siding was damaged. Ripped the siding right off this one. And look at the amount of sand in the front yard. That's about three foot of sand. Now, there's no grass showing there. They had boats in people's yards that didn't have any boats. No, I don't have a boat. Well, you do now. No, we had boats showing up. But these boats weren't in the water. These boats were on somebody else's property, and it ended up, when the sturge came in, it floated it from this house, took it inland. You know, I had people for days going around trying to find their boats. Have you seen my... Mako, have you seen my whaler? Have you seen any? I have, you know. It wasn't, we had sunken boats to deal with. We had boats that were on high and dry laying all over the place that we had to deal with in the middle of roads. You know, in the middle of roads, that's not too bad. Tie a rope to it and drag it off. Of course, that doesn't do much good for the fiberglass hull, but it's no longer blocking the road. Again, Royal Flush, it got flushed. It definitely got flushed. It got flushed into the neighborhood. You know, how about a house? You think your house is secure. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens when the house is secure and floats? Well, guess what? Mr. House Mover, could you come back and put my house back on my foundation? You know, we had a house sitting in the middle of the street down in West, in Musquamacan. The only way to get rid of it was tear it down. They had to open the road to get through to start doing other things. He took a bulldozer and just went through the front door, out the back door, made a nice wide opening. No, it's too bad. That's the way it goes. This one, I think they were able to put it back on its foundation. But these are cottages. These things were built for temporary living during the summer. They were not built structures for year-round you know, living. So they were basically had a stone foundation like this one. They put the house down on it. And they figure that's fine. Then along comes a storm like Sandy, <laughs> your house floats. Doesn't stay on the foundation, ends up on the neighbor's property. You know, that was a good one. And he had propane tanks laying all over his property. It came from somebody else. We haven't figured that one out yet. You know, here's a partial of a house, private property, no trespassing, you know, a whole thing like that. Well, don't have to worry about it. You don't have a house to be trespassed anymore, it's gone. This is one I always, I stood for an hour and a half trying to figure this one out. How does this glass tabletop not get broken? You know, the planter floated up underneath the table, floated the glass sheet off of the table, and then when the tide receded, everything sat back down and it didn't break the glass. You know, I scratched my head for a couple of hours on that one, figuring out how the hell, where did this... And, for, and what made it even stranger, we don't know where that planter came from. Came from somewhere. Now, there's me. That's the level. Now, that's the level we were dealing with. Now, four foot. All came off of the beaches. And right now, we're just starting to replenish the sand back on state beaches and everything else. 
And I was down there the other day, you know, going through the stuff. They were sifting out of the sand, taking care of problems. And one of the things I always had to laugh at, I was standing right there, and a woman came up to me and says, when are you going to put my sand back? Excuse me? I said, yo, I want my sand back on my beach. Mm, well, I don't think the state is going to put sand back on your beach. Uh, well, I want my sand back. I said, ma'am. We're going to put the sand back on the beaches as best we can, but we're not, you know, we're not here to use taxpayers' money to replenish the sand on somebody's private beach. Well, I know what my sand is. Excuse me? I want the sand that I bought put back on my beach. Uh, and I asked the supervisor, how do you know what sand is yours? Well, I know my sand. I said, how do you know your sand? I bought very fine sand. I said, well, ma'am, I'll give you a number. You can talk to them. I figured that's enough of that. Let somebody else enjoy this question and answer. But she was dead certain. She knew her sand. And she knew where the sand was in the state piles. And all I could tell her was, good luck. But anyway, all this sand has to be taken off of private property and put back somewhere. Where did we put it? Down at Mesquamacate in the parking lot. So I don't, the beach may be open, the parking lots may not be, just to let you know. So before you go to the beach, check with the parking people. But we took, I forget how many thousands and thousands, somebody told me it was over 30,000 cubic yards of sand was taken off of the roads in the area. And all I can tell you was the piles were big in the parking lot. You know, heavy rains cause flooding in the low-lying areas, the flood caused serious damage to structures. And what I mean by that is along some of the streams and ponds, we ended up having houses moved off of their area where they were sitting. Now, these, again, are temporary type of houses. These are cabins, summer cabins. They're not made with anything going into the ground very much. But here it is. The there's the house. There's where it was. You know, the tide came in that high and floated the whole thing inland. Now, some of them were far enough inland that they weren't on their property anymore. They were on the neighbor's property. You know, we had power outages because they floated the, po the, the pole right out of the ground. You know, there's a hydraulic pressure. When the ground is flooded, the pole wants to float. And the pole floated out of the ground and fell over. The biggest problem we were thinking we were going to run into are containers. You know? I, when I'm sitting at the command center and we're thinking about what we're going to have to be doing, you know, we were sure that we knew what we were going to run into. It was going to be another 2010 flood with, with all sorts of oil tanks involved and everything. And it was a little bit different. It wasn't quite as I thought. In a certain way, good. But what we had was a lot of fuel sources floating. Here's a, you know, what they call a 100-gallon Propane tank, 100 gallons of propane weighs about 200 pounds, 250 pounds, somewhere in that range. Well, propane in a tank, water comes in, displaces it. Water being heavier, tank floats. Now, what you were hoping was the tank stayed where the house was and didn't break or leak. Now, they stick there. Some of them, as I said, ripped the thing right out of where it's joined to the house, but they did not leak. You know, it's unfortunate because when the storm hit, a lot of people weren't living at their residences. They were had gone back to Connecticut, New York, wherever they came from. So the summer community had left. And now a lot of these, you know, the biggest problem we had was we got the fire department. And as soon as the storm was abated and we started to see some of the issues, we had the fire departments going around to every single home in that territory, shutting down propane tanks. Some were leaking. Some of them didn't stay together like this. So the best thing they could do is shut off the system. You know, here's one. The tank didn't float. The propane tank did. You know, I could have sworn I was going to find that thing laying on its side or in somebody else's yard. Not that I didn't, but I didn't find it here. What I found was the propane tank has a better tendency to float than the oil tank. 
You know, propane being gas, basically it can float a lot easier than a liquid that's oil, even though the oil is lighter than water. You know, the tank stayed put. The hazardous materials we were breaking into damaged the heating oil tanks and damaged the propane systems. That was our major headache during this storm. This was the headache that we had right after the storm hit and left the area. You know, the next day, I've been up all night. I'm heading for home. Next thing you know, I'm getting called by a fire chief. We got a problem. And I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. I got an oil tank in the middle of the road. You do? Okay, I'll come down and see what you got. Well, I didn't know that down in South County, 90% of the homes are on propane. So to get to the oil tank, I had to move 14 propane tanks out of the road. No? Oh, yeah, I've got problems, but i got to get this oil tank. And I'll move that propane tank out of the way. And some of them were 500-gallon size. They were big. You know, here's the situation. The house basement got flooded. The oil tank floated and flipped over and spilled the oil. Now, normally speaking, not knowing who you are, what you have in your basement, but if you get an oil tank, it goes through the wall to the outside where the fill and vent are. So you've got, hopefully, hard pipe going through your wall. They didn't have that here. Their fill and vent were on top of the tank, which was sitting in their garage, in the flooded areas. So there was nothing to prevent it from flipping over once the tanks started to float. No, it sought the lowest, whatever you could call the lowest level for it to float, and it flipped on its side. When it did, whatever was in the oil tank above that halfway point came out of the tank onto the floor. That's red oil. Now, unfortunately, it didn't stay in the house. It floated all the way out into the neighbor's yards. The fire department was out shutting down propane tanks when all of a sudden they're running across oil in the street. Well, they were able to track it back to the house, and that's what I got a phone call for. It's a spill inside the house. Now, when you spill oil, and now it's all in wet material and everything else like that, it is a mess. Everything is contaminated. Not only with the water, but now it's all contaminated with oil. So basically, they had a finished basement. By the time when the storm was over with and we were done with that location, they had no finished basement. $24,000 later, they were able to get their house basically back to the shell. Everything else had to be cleaned up. This one just showed up. And so, this is the one that I was going to. This tank just showed up in somebody's yard. Now, the people there are on gas, not oil. You know, this is down in Green Hill Beach. I went out there after pushing tanks out of the way and driving through the sand and everything else. I was able to get down to the end property. Oh, by the way, when you hear about federal, uh, you know, flood insurance, well, it's only good for the first $250,000. This home was $1.5 million. So the, if they lost the whole structure, they're only going to get $250,000 from the insurance company. I didn't know that, but the people living here told me about that. All right. Basically, we got an oil tank sitting in the middle of their yard. It has leaked. Now what are we going to do? Well, first of all, we tried to figure out who it belongs to. Now, if we can figure out who it belongs to, we're going to get in touch with them and say, hey, you want your tank back? Come and get it. And by the way, clean it up. Well, couldn't do that. I asked, and eventually what we figured out, it came over from Block Island. It washed in because Block Island's right across the, the bay there. I said, wow, that's interesting. I called up Block Island and said, anybody missing an oil tank? Uh, yeah, a couple people. Uh, anybody, you know... Looking for one? We have one over here in Green Hill. No, nobody's really looking for one, you know. Anyway, so we ended up calling a contractor ourselves for this one since we couldn't identify a source and ending up having to clean it up. Now, the problem was when it floated away from the house, it took the line with it and broke off the uh, connection right here. So there wasn't much oil left in it to deal with. 
it was pretty much of an empty by the time we started full with it. But again, now we've got to dig up all the soil around the tank that we think is contaminated. You know, sand is a, is a lousy thing to try to clean up oil with. Again, and I got a phone call from Wesley. Hey, there's a tank in the middle of my driveway. Really? Oh, I always love it. People, yeah, I got a tank. Well, okay. Where is it? In the middle of my driveway. Okay, let's go look at it. So I drive down there. And I come around the corner, and here's this driveway to the back of his property, and here's the tank. I said, that's your tank, right? No, it's not my tank. Well, he was right. It's his neighbor's tank. It floated from the back of the building where it had been on these cinder blocks right here. The water had raised up high enough to cause it to flaw over on its side, and then as the tide went out, so goes the tank down the street. This is all oil in here. You can't see it with the red, but all of this is oil. And where does it go? Under the house. A little fire hazard here. Just a mite. So we ended up calling a contractor and having him sit there for about 12 hours, sucking the oil from underneath the house and getting rid of the tank in the street. So that was fun. Actually, I only had about four tanks. All that hurricane, I only had four oil tanks that had problems. I had probably three, four hundred propane tanks, though. Here's a place right next door. The connections again. You can have all size tanks. There's a, that's a, basically a thousand gallon tank that floated. It was up on top of that. When it ended up, it was down on the ground next to it. You know, it was originally up here up on these blocks. When it ended up, it ended up sitting on the ground. Could have rolled on its side. I don't know why not, except maybe because it was up against the fence. But that's a lot of propane if it lets go. You know, some of the special issues we had during the hurricane, we had a couple. Basically, in the middle of a hurricane, what don't you want to have happen? A fire. You know, it's not going to be an easy fire to put out, as the fire department found out. It turned out to be a barn fire. Now, there's all sorts of issues here because the house was vacant. So how does a barn fire get started in the middle of a hurricane? Well, here's the house. It's all boarded, basically shut up. Nobody's living there. And behind it is the barn. Turns out, it's interesting, this thing right here is a safe. That's a safe. It's interesting to see that somebody tried to cut it open. Now, let's guess where the fire got started. Right there. Now, the problem we had was, well, there were issues there that weren't known before the fire. One of the issues were empty dr were drums, not empty. They were full of oil. One was full of a, an acid material. The other one's full of like a lubricating oil. They were in the barn area. You know, the place was closed up. Nobody had done an inspection, you know. So we found out, unfortunately, we found out later on. Now, this material here, he had a whole bunch of paint. These are the paint cans all piled up. There's about 35 paint cans in this one spot. There were several of those spots in that barn. And that's cuprinol, so that's a flammable paint. Those are the drums. You know, they were sitting out there next to where the barn was. You know, we ended up declaring this an emergency, called out a contract, said, let's clean it up. We'll worry about who owns it after we get all through. But we can't just leave it. These, fire, these drums have been exposed to a fire. God knows if they're going to survive for any period of time. So we said, that's it. We'll empty the drums and take care of that problem. During this whole thing, down around, uh, I think it was around Charleston Beach, they found a shipwreck. When the sand was washed away, lo and behold, they found the backbone of an old shipwreck. So probably sometime in like the 1800s, there was a shipwreck on the shore down there, and this is what was left of it. Now it had been buried in the sand all along. And what was interesting was all the type of the way it was fitted. Basically tongue groove, locked in with wooden pegs and everything. You know, things show up, you know. It's very interesting to see what a storm can turn up 
after it removes all the sand that's been building up over these years. We thought we were pretty well done. You know, we thought, okay, we took care of the oil tanks, we took care of the propane tanks. The way we took care of the propane tanks was I called up all the distributors in the area, both Coventry, I mean, both uh, Rhode Island and down in Connecticut. And say, hey guys, do you have any customers in Rhode Island, in the beach areas? Yeah. Why don't you send your teams out to have them check their locations, see if their tanks are loose, detached, or missing, or what? So I had, when I was out there, I was passing Petrolane, Arrowgas, Stargas, uh, I forget, all the different gas companies out of New Jersey were all in that area doing what they had to do, find what was missing. They were inventorying, and I got a list of the ones that were missing. I got a list of the ones that were found and taken back. You know, we told them, look, until the house is declared safe, take the propane tank with you. Get it back to your shop. Don't leave it at the house. If the house is not able to be lived in, I don't want a propane tank laying there. When we did all that, I thought, okay, we got it all under control. We got it all under control. Never dawned on me that all of a sudden, all the insurance companies were going to tell all their clients, clean out your basements, get rid of all this, the damaged material. Now, what are they going to do with their damaged material? They're going to put it out on the roadside. I go back there when I think I'm all done, and I'm going down roads like this, and I go, oh, man. Where the hell did all this come from? Well, people were just bringing it out, leaving it on the side road, figuring the town or city is going to pick it up under cash, trash collection. All of a sudden, we're looking at, oh my, we got another problem arising. Because now what they did was the towns and cities says, oh, we'll take care of this problem. They got the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, whoever was a, a local agency to go around to the piles and sort the pile for them. So you have kids going out on Saturdays, Sundays, going through the pile of debris, pulling out stuff. You know, here would be a metal pile, there would be a wood pile, and over there would be a hazardous waste pile. Now, so as the, as the days went on, it got, to me, it got worse than it was before. Because all of a sudden now, I got this out on the side of the road. You know, a car swerves off the road, hits this, man, it could explode, you know, could spill, could react. I'm all of a sudden, I'm all dealing with hazardous waste. You know, how much waste? Well, think about how many homes were involved and then think about what everybody here has in their home. Yeah. You know, they separated. They put a container full of hazardous waste here and then the rest of the stuff was, well, I don't know, garbage. Again, okay, I've got flammable paints. I got oil. I got a pesticide. I got another pesticide. Over here, I've got some more flammable paints, house cleaner. You know, God knows what everything else is here. I do know that if it all gets mixed, it can pose a very serious poisonous situation. So I'm here trying to figure out what I'm going to be doing. You know, so we ended up working with the cities and towns that were involved with this type of a situation and say, look, you know that Eco Depot that is there to collect homeowners' trash that's up in Johnson? Well, what we're going to do is take that Eco Depot location and put it in Charleston at a location. We'll put it in Westerly at a location, and we'll allow the homeowners to bring the stuff to that. Now, that was all fine and good, except for one problem that I had already mentioned. We're dealing with the summer community. The summer community wasn't there when the collection days were operating. So that meant all the homeowners weren't going to bring all the hazardous waste to the collection point. So I ended up having to call out contractors in the cities and towns to say, guys, I hate to tell you this, but we're going to have to go out there and pick it up ourselves. You know, we'll take it to where the, where the waste day is going to be held, and they can process it when they get there. So for days or weeks afterwards, we were going around to the different locations, taking all the stuff that was left on the side of the road, bring it to the collection point where it was stored properly until they could collect it by the Eco Depot and their contractor. But again, we're starting to deal with some really nasty materials. And again, you run into everything. Paints are primarily, I would say 90% of the waste was paint. Maybe 5% was home 
cleaning agents, bleach and so forth, and then you know maybe one or two percent was pesticides, fertilizers, things like that. And again, you, you go down the street and you know you well stop at this house, but the next house is just as bad or worse. So it's like I can only fill my vehicle up to a certain point, then I have to go dump it, get rid of it, then come back. You know, I was going maybe half a street, and then I have to go to the garage to get rid of the stuff. Then I have to come back. Basically, we set up a couple of collection points. But we found out that we couldn't rely on those collection points to get the stuff because nobody was going to bring it to them because all the people who were living in these summer cottages were in New York City or, you know, New Haven or wherever. So we had to do a lot of the work ourselves to get the stuff out of the public domain. You know, the way this stuff was was right on the side of the road. You know, people can get into it. I mean, it was funny because they, had a re they arrested a couple of people for scrounging. You know, they had all the, like, the dryers out on the side of the road, all the white goods and things like that. They had people from I don't know where going around taking the good-looking refrigerators or the washer and dryers and everything else like that, and they were taking them away. Now, what was happening to those was they probably took them back, dried them out, and sold them on the eBay. You know, don't ever buy a car after a hurricane. Again, basically what we try to do is make it easy to get the material out of the public domain. And that meant us, our contractors, and the cities and towns had to put out personnel to do it. Otherwise, it never have gotten done. Again, a lot of times what we would do to help out the cities and towns is we go out and separate the material into groups so that when the city came through, they could pick up all paint. Then they could come through and pick up fertilizers. Then they could come through and pick up. This way, they weren't co-mixing material in their truck that basically shouldn't be co-mixed. You know, if you mix a fertilizer with a cleaning agent, you can end up with an explosion. So we made sure that when we separated them, they knew, okay, all that's paint over there. Everything is paint. We can take that. Everything over here is gasoline or oil. And they can take that. What they try to do is pick up like material when they went out to pick things up. So they didn't cold mix them. Again, we, we, we ended up with a little bit of explosives and ammunition. You know, what did, what did we do with that? Well, we didn't ask the cities and towns to deal with that. We're in the state of Rhode Island. If it's explosive, the people who handle it would be Jimmy or the state fire marshal's office or at the last extreme, ATF. The ammunition was basically turned into the local police departments to properly dispose of. You know, I found two guns, two handguns. They were turned in. I had to fill out a document where they came from, the address and everything else like that. Because the, the police wanted to know all the particulars, you know. It took me half an hour to get rid of two, two pieces. Again, the major amount of flammable material that would come from a homeowner, like any of you sitting here, would be paint. Now, I, I don't know what it is, but when we run waste days for the public, enough paint comes in to paint half of the state of Rhode Island. I don't know what it is, but I, I know what I do, which is wrong. My wife tells me, we've got to paint this room. I'll go out to the local hardware store and buy the paint. What I didn't do was go downstairs and look at what I had in storage. Oh, no, that's old stuff. I mean, I've had cartons of paint come in where one can has been open, the rest are unopened. Now, I don't know what it is. You know, for the state of Rhode Island, you could paint your house 14 times over with the amount of paint that we've recovered. But that's what the primary hazardous waste for homeowners is, paint. Why do you have a paint exchange? Our dump has a book exchange. We have done that. Do you know what the problem is? Everybody gets out of their cars to go to the swap table. Stops the whole operation. We've actually given paint to URI. You know who we gave it to? Yeah, well, you know who we've given it to? Fine Arts Center. They use it on their backdrops. So we've done that. We've given it to uh, you know, uh, self-help groups. You know? But again, can we guarantee the paint is good? No. Nope. I don't know if the paint has been frozen, if it's been diluted. or anything. 
So we have to worry about, you know, if it's an unopened can, maybe we could give it away. But most cans are partially open. You know, some of them are hard. Some are, you know, mucky. Some have paintbrushes in them. Some have rollers in them. But anyway, we tried that a couple of times. And it takes a lot of effort. So in the, in the long run, what, what we found out was it was just easier to get rid of it than to try to, you know, recycle it. And again, I always remember we ran waste days where we set up a table off to the side of materials like cleaning agents, things like that that weren't, you know, dangerous per se. And we ended up having more people picking up stuff at the, at the pickup table. You know, they're, they're standing around, oh, yeah, I could maybe use this or I could... Instead of picking it up and leave, they all stand around for a half an hour going through to what we find. You know, every, I, I don't know. People are scroungers, like me. Yeah, my wife told me, no more going to the landfills. We have enough junk in the house. But again, you got, you know, car stuff is another thing. Gasoline, you know, five-gallon cans of gasoline. We found a lot of those. Household cleaning agents are another big issue. Bleach. I had enough bleach to probably fill up, you know, three, four hundred gallon, you know, in a mount. Everybody had Clorox bleach. <sighs> Finally, it was time to relax. Not often do I have to say that, but after we were done picking stuff up, it felt good to say, Mesquamacate is clean. I did every street three or four times. I knew that place better than people who lived there did. You know, and then this spring, I thought I was all done. I'm back out in the swamps looking for material that got washed off of the beach out into the wetlands area. You know, we found some more propane tanks. So just when you think you're done, nah, it's never done. Are there any questions? Yes? Are the homeowners that are present when this was happening, did you find them and are they billed for the cleanup? Or does it take, does the state take over that? We do this. We look at the, at the full picture. In other words, we see if there was any, anything that the homeowner should have done that they didn't. And if we can show that there was justifiable cause for the material not to have been damaged or floated away or whatever, then we potentially are going to go after that person. But in most cases, what we found was act of God. It was a storm. You know, everybody thought the storm was going to be this, and it turned out to be this. So therefore, we really can't go to court and argue the point that, yeah, we want to find this person. And they're going to say, what happened? Well, he lost his oil tank, or this floated away, and this caused damage here. Can't always do that, because now I'm dealing with people who are probably in the same situation as the person who's on trial. And where do you think I'm going to get? Nowhere. So what we did was we waited. If it was a certain amount of money which was allowable, we just cleaned it up. It would take too much effort to try to nail somebody for something that was an act of God. So, yeah. The other materials, the furniture and all that, mattresses and all that stuff, that you, you all don't have to pick that stuff up. Do you have what happened there, yeah, what happened there was most of that material, there's another, what, there's a part of DEM called solid waste. Solid waste section. And they run the landfills. They run the transfer stations. They run the garbage trucks, whatever. And what they did was, what we had learned during the 2010 flood was you can get reimbursed, the landfills and everybody can get reimbursed for those funds that they expend if you set up a program with FEMA, which is called debris management. In other words, in, a, in any big storm, you're going to have debris. Some of it may be trees. Some of it may be household goods, something... But you set up what they call a debris management area. So at the landfills, we set up a debris management area. And what happened was, as the trucks came in, if they had white goods, they went to this location where they were dumped. And then a contractor was brought in to take out all the refrigeration gases. And then all the material was crushed and set for scrap metal, recycled. If it was debris management, which is uh, tree debris, you know, vegetation debris, the trees were ground up into wood chips. The wood chips were then able to be used as wood chips are. They went up to the paper mills up in uh, Maine. They loaded up truck after truck after truck. Wood chips, they sent them up to the paper mills where they burned. So we were able to cut down there. If it was stumps and things like that, well, those things would be crushed up and then used as, 
intermediary cover at the landfill. In other words, between this day's garbage and the next day's garbage, there was a layer. It's not final cover, but there's a layer of material that they put down to hold down what's in the landfill. And that could be this intermediary cover, which would have been ground up stumps with everything else. They would also separate out hazardous waste if they found it. The problem was not every place had them separating it out in the first place. So when a bulldozer came in and just scooped this stuff up and dumped in it, a lot of the stuff that went in there was also hazardous waste. So it was primarily in Misquamacate that we had the real issue with it on the side of the road. But again, that's debris management. And if you set up those programs prior to the storm, you get coverage for it by FEMA. So it saves a lot of money in that aspect because what's the storm going to produce most of? Debris. It may be de a demolition debris or it may also be uh, you know, metal debris. It might be household good debris. And again, a lot of the homes, literally, if it was a finished basement, it was outside. The water came in the, the front of the house and flushed everything out through the back. And there were several times, you know, you find uh, somebody's couch two blocks over from where they started. So, but again, what, what they tried to do is they tried to separate it into lake material so that when the contractors went around, they picked up white goods here for this time. Then the next time they picked up like couches and furniture and stuff like that, took it away. But then we had the guys who were freelancing picking up stuff too. You know, eBay must have been swamped with stuff after this, this hurricane. So it's just one of the things where we try to cut down. That's why that preparation is so necessary. It's such a necessity prior to the time of the storm. You're trying to get all your ducks in a row so that when you do institute the program, the federal government has already said, that's fine. If you don't, and the federal government says, well, you didn't talk to us first, we may not pay for it. So we learned that during the 2010 floods. Yes? Why not just a couple of very simple codes? I mean, I just poured... Oh, I, I, I love what you just said, the worst thing you, I could have ever said. Simple codes. Now, let's see. I just poured a slab. I know. I propane tank myself, and I could very easily have just put an eye hole into the They did. Lab. They did. They did. Uh, who was it that did that? Uh, I think it was Arrow Gas. And what happened was the slab wasn't big enough. So I had a propane tank with a chain connected to a concrete slab in somebody's yard who didn't have propane. And they, we, luckily, you know, what I like to see are names on propane tanks. Like any time if you go to fill a propane tank, you know, or you do something like that, try to get a sticker on it, <laughs> say who it belonged to. But anyway, I always was looking for the name of the company because as soon as I got a name of a company, I was on the phone saying, hey, guys, I got one of your tanks on this address. Come and get it. That was fine, because they come and take it away. You know, those things are heavy. Well, what I was thinking is dig down three to four feet and pull one of those boots onto a sonotube. So now, in the ground, you're flared out with the concrete, and anything that would have to come up would have to lift that boot of concrete. Well, they have to lift up the underground mushroom, basically. Right. Oh, I, I like your thoughts. I really do. The only problem is, the only problem is trying to get it through the politicians. You know, if they, so who's going to pay for this thing to put in the ground? It's $40. No, that's what you say. Who's going to dig the hole? Who's going to get the concrete? Well, yeah. That's it. Yeah. I, mean, I do most of my own work, so I know that's fine. how much work, and it's not that expensive. No, probably $100. You can do it all. But the issue they're going to run into is, well, we haven't had a hurricane like this in 40 years. Why go to all that expense? I've had that issue several times with oil tank. Why do I need to change out my oil tank? Oil tanks only last 25 years. That's their life expectancy. So after 25 years, you should replace your oil tank. Why? It looks good. Yeah, but it's not good on the inside. It's riding from the inside out. Well... It's been good all these years. I don't think there'll be a problem. You know, you try to get somebody that's going to cost you $1,000 to replace your oil tank. Okay, 
you know, I, I rest my case, you know, how many people are actually going to do it? I did it because I know what this spill can do. I know that if you spill in a finished basement, we're talking $30,000. But again, one of the biggest issues I had was I thought there were going to be a lot of oil tanks, and there were only like three or four that I ended up dealing with. I had hundreds of propane tanks, and I never thought about the propane tanks. But lo and behold, as I said, I did have one that had, was tied, was chained to an anchor, but the anchor floated with the oil tank. So it was a good idea, but they didn't put a big enough anchor on. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Jimmy?